three questions. One is, what is liberty itself? And the second is, why is it good, if that's a separate question? And the third, on the next, on the back side, is can there be something called a right to liberty? Those three questions, I think, will get us organized about the remainder of the class and give us also some, some useful um, background. The readings consist, as I can see most of you have, of these orange colored materials. Um, there's more in here than I actually could reasonably expect you to read. I view this partly as a source book. And one of the things I would like to do is simply point out to you, particularly on the American cases, which are quite long, what you might find of use when and if you get a chance to look at them or have an occasion to refer to them. Um, the materials are organized roughly in the order in which I'm going to organize these discussions, uh, as we'll see. Let me talk a little bit about the relation of liberty as such to the concerns of a seminar that's concerned in general about human rights. Um, on the outline, I have four things as to why you should care about liberty if you're interested in human rights. I'm just wandering through those. One starts with John Locke in 1660. When Locke organized himself to give lectures at Oxford in 1660, he told his students that the very idea of rights is itself, he said, a doctrine of freedom. That there's a connection between the concept of a right to anything, not just a right to liberty, but a right to anything, and liberty. Now, why would he think? that something that is itself the subject of a right, at least according to the French and the Americans, right? Two great revolutions. They were fought for three great rights. One of each was supposed to be the right to liberty. But in addition to being a discrete right, liberty is thought to be something about the nature of all rights. All rights, in a sense, are doctrines of liberty. Any sense of what Locke had in mind? part of the idea of liberty. One way to view our seminar, if he's right, would be we're talking about all rights, not just the right to liberty. Yeah? Uh, as I understood, you're talking about the general right to Rights, but here's Locke's point. All rights, no matter what you claim a right to, all rights are in, assess, in essence part of liberty. So not just the right to free speech, which is a particularly a particular liberty, but the right to be free of an unjust punishment, the right to a fair distributive share in the benefits of our social cooperation, distributive justice, the right to be free of a delayed trial. All rights, he said, are part of liberty. It's what he had in mind. His idea of rights was the Enlightenment idea juxtaposed against the older notion of duty-based moralities particularly of the medieval times from St. Thomas Aquinas and others. What he saw was that rights give their holder an option to waive them or to assert them. And that's, he thought, a doctrine of freedom. The very idea of rights has within it, said Locke, the notion of liberty. Different than the medieval morality of natural law, which also had a notion of rights, but they were rights based on duties. What was fundamental were duties to God, to society. If you were the beneficiary of a duty, in a weak sense, you had a right. But Locke reversed it. Locke said, there are duties that are based on rights, not just rights based on duties. And if the right is based, if the right is what grounds the duty, the right holder, can waive the right. And in that sense, the very idea of a basic right, a basic human right, something that you're free to waive, something you don't have to assert, is itself a doctrine of freedom. So one connection between liberty and rights as such is what's usually called the choice conception of rights. Namely, to have a right is to have a choice about whether it's exercised or not. And to have a choice is to be free to exercise such a choice, which is what gives post-Lockean enlightenment human rights theory of morality much more a flavor of liberty. 
than the kind of duty-based morality of, say, the Catholic Church or the Catholic tradition that preceded it by hundreds and hundreds of years. So that's one connection between liberty and rights in general. The second connection, as I put down on the outline, is that there is something called the right to liberty. There is supposed to be a right to liberty as such, as opposed to rights to particular liberties like free speech. And that's the discrete topic of the seminar. What would the content of a general right to liberty look like? That's not supposed to be some small part of a doctrine of human rights or a small part of a theory of a liberal state, usually in political theory. People define liberal states in terms of their protection of two things, liberty and equality, the two values common to both the French and the American revolutions. So that liberty becomes the content of a right and not simply the character of all rights. There is, it is thought, a right to liberty or so the American and the French revolutions thought. The last important connection is this one. I uh, was reading on the plane over a brand new book that just came out from Oxford on the limits of criminalization. It's been noticed that the Anglo-American system has over-criminalized its society. There are about 7,500 7, things you can't do in the United Kingdom by virtue of penal code. In America, there are about 15,000 things that you can't do, types of actions that are prohibited. America now has the most imprisoned society in the history of the world. We have 1.2 million people behind bars. Everybody says that's too much criminal law, partly because of the war on drugs. Liberty, it is thought, is the best theoretical bulwark against criminal law reaching too far, there being too many crimes and thus too many prisoners. It's not the only thing that liberty is good for, but one of the things liberty does is constrain the criminal law. And in that sense, it's of great topical uh, importance. Anyway, that's why I want to talk about liberty. Um, let me go ahead and start on the first of the three things I want to talk about, um, which really starts with this classic essay by Isaiah Perlin on page one of your materials on two concepts of liberty, probably the most famous essay on liberty written since John Locke stopped writing, uh, at least in English. He says in his very first sentence, um, to coerce a man, he says, is to deprive him of freedom, but he's worried that the word freedom means almost anything. Almost every moralist in human history has praised freedom. It's so porous, there's little interpretation that it can't exist. Now there is a problem about liberty, like all honorific terms in a language. It's so universally regarded as good, it gets appropriated to cover almost anything that somebody likes, in which event it loses its descriptive content. So the first thing I want to do is see if we can rescue it from that situation. What is it we mean by liberty is what Isaiah Berlin, in part, wants to talk about, uh, and so do I. So I'm asked this question, what is liberty? If any of you taught undergraduates in philosophy, you know that they love to get um, eloquent and profound when they ask what is questions like this. Have you ever heard a college sophomore discourse on what is truth, or what is love, or what is beauty? What is questions, as Herbert Hart used to say at Oxford, what is questions need a lot of work before you answer them, just to make clear what it is you're asking and why you want to know. So if you say something like, what is law, or what is liberty? What is it you're trying to bring out? I had three potential things that people I think generally ask and answer when they ask those questions on the outline. One is the least common, but nonetheless I'll mention it anyway. Um, if somebody says, what is gold, maybe they literally don't know. 
the class of things to which the word makes reference. In which event, you simply have to show them what I call the referent of the word. You have to show them the stuff. You say, well, gold is that stuff over there if you happen to have any around. Sometimes when you ask, what is something, what is gold, you're asking for its essential properties. If it has some, either it's real, or as Locke would say, it's nominal essence. It's real properties that are essential to it. That's what makes gold gold, or at least analytically, by the concept of gold, it has to have these properties to be meant as gold. It's essential properties. Third, some things all people want to know is useful handles, what it's good for. It's moral properties, it's social properties. Gold is the most valuable commodity. Gold is what you need jewelry of, stuff like that. So, three sorts of answers. One is it picks out the discrete item. Two, it gives its essential nature. Or three, it lists some useful set of properties that call it to mind. So, suppose we ask them about liberty. What is liberty? Notice Isaiah Berlin spends a fair amount of time answering that question in my first sense. He wants to pick it out as different than equality, than democracy, than all the other good things there are, than justice, and so forth. This is on, and I'll refer to the pages that I put on there, on page three of the materials. We're on the second column. He wants to say, um, you may give up your liberty for these other things, but be clear, they're very different different, say, than equality. You want to take a stab at it? What does he think, or what do you think? The difference is between, say, liberty and equality. Let's start with that. The two great values of the French Revolution, liberté, égalité, or of the American Revolution, liberty, equality, and property. What's the difference? Well, Were the French going to the barricades for two things or one thing? Yeah. And freedom of a society, or if you like, a nation. Now, not so long ago, America had a president who spent a lot of his time over here in Europe, President Bush during his second term, giving what he called freedom speeches. He was lecturing the Europeans on the benefits of freedom. He was talking, I think, about free societies i.e., what, what it means for a country to be free. You think that has to do with equality? I don't know what was Bush talking about, so I cannot agree. Well, but, but, but that's okay. Most of us didn't understand what Bush was talking about much of the time. But if he was talking about a free society, on you know, this view, he was talking a bit about the distribution in a society of liberties. But isn't there a sense of, I mean, that, that's Berlin's point about free. It's used so often. Isn't it possible he was talking about a free society in the sense in which the Scots wanted to be free of the English? Namely, they just didn't want to be politically dominated. A free society is one where you rule yourself rather than rule by a foreign power, in which event it's simply free in the sense of free of foreign coercion. It could be that way, but it could be also the way when, for example, whereas a uh, a despot uh, that uh, gets over the society, and the society are slaves, and the, the only uh, free person is the, well, the sovereign. Well, that's so a good it, would be, it would be the case of unfree society too. No, that's a good point. Notice he discusses on page five, second column, whether there's a connection between liberty in the sense he cares about and democracy. So he takes your hypothetical. Can you have a totalitarian society in terms of its mode of government? that's nonetheless protecting of liberty. Now, he thinks the answer to that question is yes. Indeed, it's a contingent question whether a free society in the sense of self-ruling people is a free society in his sense, which is protecting of individual liberty from state coercion. Right? So he thinks there's no connection between democracy and freedom in his sense, liberty, in another sense, of course, it's called the liberty of the ancients. The liberty of the ancients was participation in the political system, what we would call democracy. But his sense of liberty isn't that at all. His sense of liberty is you could have no right of political participation 
you could be in a complete totalitarian society. And yet it might be, it turns out contingently, I don't think that's true. It might be, though, true that it protects individual liberty fiercely. You could have a strongly libertarian emperor. I see that um, Otto Habsburg died over the weekend. Had he ever gotten his throne on the Austro-Hungarian Empire, he could have been an autocratic Habsburg caring deeply about the liberty of the Lemberg citizens. I was astonished to take the funds and see that they still call the Vive Lemberg on the, uh, on the uh, board. But nonetheless, you could have an autocratic society that protects liberty in his sense. So notice he's distinguishing liberty not just from equality, but from other popular senses of liberty, like the liberty of the ancients, the right of political participation or democracy saying there's only a contingent connection, if any connection, between liberty in the sense he cares about and liberty in the sense often used of self-rule. Now, I actually think the liberty of a society is interpretable in a way that would make it just something um, using his sense of the word. You might mean by a free society, a society that protects individual liberty in his sense. In which event, then, we just have one sense of the word that we're talking about, and the liberty of a society is piggybacked on the liberty of an individual. Namely, a free society is a society that respects the right of liberty of its citizens. Perfectly good usage of the word. Notice Berlin says there's 200 senses of the word liberty in English. That's too many. Surely not. I'd like to see 200. But it does have, we've already seen, two or three different senses. So one has to disambiguate, as the grammarians say, disambiguate the word to see what it picks out which is what we're doing. Go back to liberty and equality. I think you're exactly right. Two different things. As Berlin says, if you have a right, say, to a certain liberty, say a right of free speech, you have that irrespective of how other people are treated. Whereas equality is always comparative between persons. If you have a right of free speech, and I'm a citizen just like you, then I have a right of free speech by virtue of equality. I have a right to be treated like you if there's no morally relevant difference between us, the right of equality. But notice my right to speak freely if it's based on equality depends on somebody else already being heaven granted that right. Whereas the right of liberty itself is irrespective of how other people are treated. It's not comparative. If you have a basic human right to free speech, then it doesn't matter that other people either do or do not have that right. It matters substantively for your right to free speech that you have it, irrespective of what others have. Liberty and equality are quite different. Here's a tricky one. He says on page five that privacy is related to liberty. Is privacy the same thing as liberty? If I have a right to privacy, is that the same thing as having a right to liberty? Are those two values that are the same? No, uh, I think this well is partly, partly overlap. Pri privacy is well, really not to be uh, interfered with. No one can uh, come to my home uh, or without a uh, proper, uh, without an order, yes? Uh, there can be no search and seizure, for example. This is privacy. Well, and uh, we can uh, say that uh, it is, uh, well, partly it is a freedom. Well, freedom and privacy uh, may overlap. It sounded like they were mostly different. I am curious why, why the overlap. You gave the search and seizure. We each, in America under our Fourth Amendment, have a right against unreasonable searches and seizures. So it protects us in a certain area. Now, it's not my property. It's not a right of property privacy. So it's not simply we have the right to undisputed dominion over this area. That's property. Privacy seems to be something else. Ruth Gavison at Hebrew University has a classic. She wrote her doctor's thesis at Oxford on privacy. She said, if you look at what privacy is, it's a concern about other people having information about you. What's private is what other people don't know. Other people paying attention to you 
looking at you, for example. If they can't see you, you've got privacy. And other people having access to you, i.e. having the ability to gain information or to look at you, a threefold analysis of privacy. Privacy has to do with keeping people out of finding out about you, information, attention, access. That's a pretty good start on what privacy is. Liberty doesn't seem to have either that area of connotation about the home being the place, or the concern about what it is about privacy, namely keeping secret what you're doing in your home, the privacy has. But you said there's an overlap. Why do you think there's an overlap? Well, now, now it seems to me not so obvious. Well, but you're not the only one to think there's an overlap. The cases we're going to talk about tomorrow use liberty and privacy back and forth. And the U.S. Supreme Court has often said liberty is partly privacy and partly freedom of decision. So lots of people think there's some relationship, some overlap, as you put it. How come? Is it a contingent connection that goes like this? Everybody thinks you're freer to do things in private than in public. If we get to the cases that Heidi Hurd's going to discuss with you on Wednesday, there is this distinction, particularly on sexual offenses in the criminal code. You can do many things in private. You're at liberty. It's part of your basic liberty. I don't want to get crude, but we're going to. That's sort of the way the cases go. You can have oral sex in private, but you can't have any sex in public, is a standard criminal code. In which event, Notice the connection is that what should be private also might be what enhances the scope of things you can do, liberty. They aren't the same thing. That's important. Something the Supreme Court had to take in the United States years to find out. But there does seem to me this, this overlap. Um, so on the outline, I'm down here on, if you're looking, Roman 2, C, 1, picking out liberty as against Quality, democracy, privacy. It's pretty obvious it also picks out different things. It's not utility and it's not happiness, two other things that Isaiah Berlin mentions on page three. Happiness is really good too, but that doesn't mean it's liberty. It may mean liberty makes you happy. Maybe liberty doesn't make you happy. Maybe you like to be told what to do. That's possible. But at any event, those are different things. Happiness and utility more generally just isn't the same um, as liberty at all. So that's to say what liberty isn't. Most of Berlin's essay is to say what liberty is. What are its essential properties? What are its contingent features that seem to make it worth caring about, right? So the basic distinction he draws is between positive and negative liberty. Let's see if we can understand that one. What his essay is so famous for is this notion there are two notions of liberty that compete with each other in political philosophy in the West. And they always have been there, he thought. He didn't discover them. He said he didn't create them. He discovered them. Positive and negative liberty. He starts on my page one, bottom of that, talking about the negative sense, which is the area within which we should be left to do what we're able to do without the interference of other people absence of the restraint by others. The second, he says, top of the next page, first column, page two, called the positive sense, involved in answer to the question, who or what is the source of interference that can determine someone to do or be a certain thing? So negative liberty as a first cut, as we say, absence of the restraint of others, Positive liberty has something to do with being the source of one's own actions, is the way that he puts it. You notice by the end of the excerpt, page six, he puts it a little bit differently. Last sentence, page six. The positive conception of liberty, not freedom from, that's the negative conception, but freedom to. Freedom to do things is positive liberty. Freedom from restraint in doing things is negative liberty. 
Now put that in your own words. What's the difference between negative and positive belief? Anybody? They overlap, I mean, um, they overlap, first of all. Uh, second, when we say about uh, freedom in negative sense, or it's the word freedom um, from something, it's an absence of interference. So this is, this is quite understandable. But uh, for the uh, freedom in positive sense, it's a freedom to, um, to reach some goal, to reach some um, good, and uh, I don't think it's quite, um, quite easy to understand when we say about the source of control. I, I think of, in that case, the positive, it's uh, our ability uh, to get what we want. Right, perfect. But, but when we say the question about the source of uh, control, I, uh, for me it's not quite understandable. Maybe you could, could you clarify what that means, source of control or interference? Yeah, no, I agree with you. I don't the think... Vector, but, uh, the, source, the source thing that didn't, isn't the best way to put it. The way you just put it before I thought was excellent. Negative liberty is the absence of constraint. It's negative because it's an absence. It's the hole in the donut, not the donut. It's something that isn't there. It's the absence of restraint is negative liberty, as he says. Positive liberty, leave source out for a minute, come back to it. Positive liberty is the ability. It's the, as he puts it, freedom to, freedom to do things. Freedom in the sense of you actually can, in English, you have the power, you have the ability. In that sense, you are the source of your own actions because you're able to do them. You have that power. But source is misleading. The trick is to see that the positive liberty is an actual ability to do things. In that, if you get those two senses, you then see the debate between standard liberals in Western political philosophy and their critics, who are more radical left in the traditional way, leftists. Uh, with regard to liberty. Namely, negative liberty is simply the state getting out of your way. Positive liberty is actually having the resources to do things. It's to have an opportunity set, as the economists say, that's bigger. You can do more things. Negative liberty is one way in which you might lack positive liberty, but the left critique of liberal notions of negative liberty is it's not really worth anything itself, it's worth something, is an actual ability to do the work that you want, achieve the goals that you want, etc. Um, positive liberty is something that's an overall ability where you are the source, if you like, of succeeding in your own goals. Negative liberty is simply one of the things that can get in your way. Negative liberty is an absence of restraint. Yeah. I want to ask a question. The classic approach is that positive behavior is one, uh, it's about the behavior of the state. In negative rights, the leader is, uh, state should refrain from doing something. In positive rights, the leader sh state should do something in order to sort of provide and maintain the state. But if we are talking about the source of the classification of positive and negative, freedom, it doesn't make any difference. A different type of classification was the same, but different types of approach that we are talking about right now. I mean, the source of it doesn't make any difference. That's why I tried to get away from source as being the distinction. Because you posit, suppose a state says, well, I see two concepts of liberty. We should realize each in our state, right? As you point out, to realize negative liberty is just to get out of the way to not pass so many criminal laws, for example. For positive liberty, as you rightly said, the state actually has to do something. You have to enable people to have the resources with which, for example, to pick the job that they want. Quite right. Now, in terms of a source, there's not a distinction, because as you point out, the source of each of those is the state either not passing restrictive legislation and thus protecting negative liberty, or the state allocating resources to individuals in a way that allows them to have the ability to do what they want. So the source isn't it, but that doesn't at all collapse the distinction between negative and positive liberty. Which is why I want to put it in terms of 
Negative liberty, absence of restraint, freedom from. Positive liberty is the ability to do something, freedom to do it. Two good liberties. Now, I don't think source gets at the distinction, which is why I put it aside. I'm not sure that answers you. Does that work? Say more. Is that okay? So far? What is the difference, given that you might think a just state allocates resources to do things to protect negative as well as positive liberty, right? The way you put it. One of the aspects of negative liberties is that they're protected by a duty on the part of whoever is the duty holder, in this case the state, not to violate them. How do you not violate a negative liberty? It's by an omission. You don't pass legislation. Now, it's true. The only rights violators are not the state. There are also other people. Torture. If a state doesn't torture, it therefore um, protects your negative liberty by that absence. But if other people violate your rights, you might say, but the state has some obligation to spend resources to prevent them from doing rights violations. That can be true, too. It's not, however, the state who's doing it. It's still true. The state satisfies its correlative duty, as Hofeld would say. Its correlative duty is satisfied by not torturing itself. It may, in addition, have a positive duty to prevent other people from torturing, but that doesn't divide the distinction between negative and positive liberty. Even if there are positive duties to protect negative liberties, still, conceptually, they're negative in the sense that the correlative duty of the person who's to protect the right directly is not to do something rather than to do something. I think that distinction survives that insight about how the state should allocate resources to protect negative rights sometimes and not just positive rights. That could well be true, but the conceptual distinction is still around. Now, why do I care so much? Because the same reason Isaiah Berlin cares. However much you extol constitutions like that of the old Soviet Union that protected many positive liberties, the right to work, and so forth, there's nothing puny, shabby, or to be disregarded about protecting ne negative liberty as a separate value. Negative liberty, he wants to say, conceptually needs to be separated out so we can then assess what he thinks to be its enormous value. This is the next question I want to get to. Um, before I do that, we need to parse out, as he does, a bit more about negative liberty in terms of its nature. He has a lovely quote, I think it's from Rousseau, um, with regard to what we resent isn't so much the handicaps of nature, as the impediments put by other people. This is my little flowchart on the middle of the outline about liberty. As Berlin analyzes negative liberty, notice we start out with liberty having two senses, positive or negative. He sees there are non-human interferences, the absence of which you might also think is good, and there are human restraints, but that negative liberty as a political right is just against human constraints. Um, this is the quote from Rousseau about why we care so much about other people depriving of opportunity more than we do about nature. Whether Rousseau is right or not, I don't care. Um, for clarity, it is the case that negative liberty is about human restraint of other humans' opportunity sets as opposed to all the other ways in which we are restrained. I can't jump 10 feet. No one's restraining me, I just can't do it. If you hold me down, Rousseau, now I'm unhappy. Now you're restraining me from doing something that I want to do rather than simple nature. If you look at human restraints, think of the difference between physical restraints where you're locked up, Threats, i.e. coercion, where you're not locked up, but somebody says conditionally, if you do X, then something bad will happen to you. And lastly, very tempting, or some people think of as coercive offers. I offer you 
my kidney, or in a famous American case, I offer you my bone marrow when I'm the only person with DNA that can help you. Uh, but you'll have to pay me about $100,000 for it. What's the difference between what is coercive, a threat, and what's an offer? If I offer you a bone marrow transplant that you desperately need to stay alive for $100,000, is that an offer or a threat? Or have I threatened not to give you something you desperately need unless you pay me $100,000? You have this problem in discussing what liberty is of distinguishing between two kinds of restraints, physical and coercive, versus one kind of thing which isn't supposed to take away your liberty, it's supposed to enhance it. An offer, if it's truly an offer, increases your opportunity set rather than decreases it. You first have to get clear what's the difference between an offer and a threat. In my bone marrow case, is that an offer or a threat? You desperately want to make it for your child. You desperately want a bone marrow transplant. Your child's going to die. I offer you a bone marrow transplant for a very large sum of money. I use the word offer, I could use the word threat. I could say, look, your kid's going to die unless you pay me $100,000. And I threaten you, I will not allow that operation to go forward. So it's not in the use of the word offer or threat in English or any other language. It's not a, it's not a threat. It's an offer. How come? Do I feel, does the person who really needs the bone marrow transplant for their child feel coerced? Linguistically, it's an offer in its linguistic form. But it what if he uses the word threat? I threaten But it also could be a threat because of, because of your criteria you use. Because you say, oh, we, if we do not uh, take or accept that offer, we can we lose our opportunities, we lose our goods. So it could be both, or an offer and a threat. Why do we need to divide them in that case? Well, because liberty is supposed to depend on absence of coercion, we better figure out what coercion is or we don't know what liberty is. And if coercion is the same as an offer, then I think we're in trouble. Yeah. Oh, uh, I just wanted to uh, say that um, uh, the one who makes uh, uh, this offer, uh, he doesn't have uh, an intent to threaten. There is no intent to threaten. For example, if a uh, uh, terrorist uh, says, well, uh, I have so many people, they will stay alive, uh, and uh, well, I kill them unless uh, the government pays me, well, he tries to threaten. And th uh, this is, uh, well, a form, and it is, uh, well, essentially it is a threat. But uh, in this regard, uh, in your example, I think, uh, well, a reasonable person that says, uh, well, the things uh, like, like you, you, you said, the reasonable person doesn't have an intent to uh, threaten anyone. Does it matter if he forms his intent this way? You're in the water, you desperately need a rope or you're going to drown in this lake out here. I have a rope and I dangle it over you and I say, I threaten you with not throwing you this rope unless you pay me quite a few dollars. <laughs> and that's my intent. My intent, and I intend it. I intend to threaten you with the non-appearance of a rope. I mean, in there is something that I have, and someone who wants to deprive me from having it. Something in my possession. In case of rope or in case of kidney, I don't have it. It's not my kidney. I don't have a legitimate right to have it in my possession. That's why it cannot be threatened, but it's just an offer. So that there's a, a baseline notion between the threat-offer distinction if I'm entitled to it, then when you say you won't give it to me, I'm threatened, or you're threatened. Whereas if I'm not entitled to it, then I am increasing your possibilities, your opportunities, in which event it's an offer. You may experience it as very coercive because it's something you want very, very much. But the usual analysis of the distinction about the difference between coercive threats and offers is not how it feels to the recipient. It's rather the baseline to what is the recipient already entitled. 
And if the threat slash offer is to withdraw that to which they have a right, now it's a threat. Whereas if it's an offer to give them something to which they have yet no right, now it's an offer. So suppose you're in the water and the person dangling the rope isn't me, but it's actually the lifeguard who has an obligation to save you. If he threatens not to save you, that's a threat. You're entitled to his lifeguard. And so the very same act becomes a threat that depends on the baseline of your entitlements. And that's not a vague by degree line, but you do need that line to draw the distinction between coercion by the state and an offer by the state. Now in American constitutional law, when we're teaching constitutional law, it's the difference between the way in which the federal government can buy compliance, i.e. it offers money, it's called conditional spending, and it's a traditional way for our government to expand its powers beyond what it can coerce. It can't coerce it because it's outside of its enumerated powers, but it can make offers to its citizens or its state governments that are conditional offers saying, well, if you want more highway funds, you have to lower your or raise your drinking age for teenagers, for example. It's a way of expanding state power because it's an offer, not a threat. That distinction is absolutely essential to Berlin's notion of liberty or to the notion of liberty itself. Negative liberty is the absence of threats, not the absence of offers. Offers, however coercive they feel, increase the things you can do. If I offer you a bone marrow transplant when you did not have an entitlement to one, your opportunity set is now larger. You now have the opportunity to do what you could do before, which is die. Now you have the opportunity to live if you pay me some money. You had everything you had before, and now you have one opportunity besides, namely an opportunity to have a transplant and to actually live. Those are now uh, an increase in opportunity. So the threat offer distinction, uh, I think, is crucial, but it's not one that's hard to articulate. It is in terms of a baseline of entitlements. Yeah. But there is another problem. So, uh, from a philosophical or from an ethical point of view, uh, this man is with the rope. Does he have the obligation uh, to, to save the life of this man with the water? Yeah. So this is this is the problem. If he doesn't, if he uh, doesn't have this, this obligation, then there is no threat, and this man has no right. Yeah, exactly right. And of course, people differ about whether you have an obligation uh, in this situation. People who are usually called libertarians in American political philosophy assume the answer is no. Your obligations are not to hurt him negatively, but your obligations are not to save him. If that's your view, then offering the rope is truly an offer. But as you point out, if the view is rather, you have a universal duty to save, when you can do so at no risk or expense to yourself, then he is entitled to your opportunity and to your, to your efforts. And as you point out, then it becomes a threat to withhold that to which he's entitled. It doesn't change the dependence of liberty on the distinction between threats and offers, but of course it, it, does, it does involve a baseline that determines whether something's a threat or an offer. Quite right. Yeah. I like what you're talking about, but... Um, it's either right or wrong that we have a duty to say well. Do I don't regard that as a matter of convention. How do we decide it's right or wrong? You're saying we are supposed to uh, supposed to appeal to the uh, law of the, of the state, but uh, as a legislature, uh, the legislature is supposed to establish that point, establish what is supposed to be right, what is supposed to be wrong or a duty. So uh, we have to find criteria that are not uh, that are some some else criteria. And in, uh, in our discussion, I do not uh, see that criteria. Could you establish it, or is it conventional? It's not conventional, but you're quite right. If we're doing, leave the law out for a minute, if we're just doing morality, then the question is to establish the baseline of entitlement, which is the only meaningful way to distinguish threats from offers, which is the only way to give a line to liberty, is to figure out what are the entitlements. Now, you can't ask me for that because that's all of morality. 
all the things you're morally entitled to sets the baseline, whatever they are. Now, I don't think that's conventional. Now, the same is true about law. But the law of many societies, take the French. The famous non-rescue was on the Normandy beach, where this mother saw her son trapped below Mont Saint Michel with the giant 70-foot tides. And she ran down to help him, and she drowned in the attempt to save her son. And the French tourists sitting up on the castle had never called the gendarmes. They simply had said, um, one of them said to the other, I got the whole thing on videotape, i.e. they were videotaping this mother drowning trying to save her kid, rather than doing anything to help. Did that violate French law? The answer is no. In which event, any kind of gesture they made, offer slash threatening to help, would have been an offer, legally, because of that entitlement. So the law can be just as clear as morality in setting these entitlements. And then you can distinguish between a threat and an offer. Right, another case about the uh, economical uh, distribution of goods, the Marxist or socialist case. Uh, could we say that uh, the, um, the behavior of some class, economical class, uh, exploitation of other people, uh, is a coercion, according to Berlin? I don't well, know if that's I the, understand the Berlin. That's, 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 I think, the benefit of the threat offer distinction. Exploitation well covers my offer to give you a bone marrow transplant that you desperately need and I will extract as much money from you as I can, which is a lot. That is a kind of exploitation, right? It's still an offer. It's still an offer because they do not have an uh, obligation to, to distribute goods in a certain way or do not exploit, is that? That's right. Okay. But if your view is, my bone marrow is a common asset to all of you, now you have a theory of distributive justice that sets the baseline of entitlements quite differently. And now my, th my threat to withhold is truly a threat because you already have an entitlement to what I say I now won't give you. But that would be a different theory of distributive justice and one that's counterintuitive to most of us with regard to our own bodies. But, but exploitation is interesting. Exploitation is a word that covers many offers and not just threats. Okay, we were simply exploring what liberty is um, in terms of the nature of negative liberty. I have one other point that I guess we'll now just raise briefly because we need to go on. If you look at the last page of Isaiah Berlin, in this long footnote on what, my page six, he discusses not what I would call the ambiguity of liberty. He has these two senses, positive and negative. Another defect in natural languages is vagueness, and he recognizes that liberty might have some vagueness. Namely, liberty seems to come in degrees. And he says, we got to make sense of how there can be more or less liberty. And he tries to give you some suggestions about when someone has more versus less liberty. Start where Berlin starts. When the gunman comes up to you with a gun at your head, and says, your money or your life? Do you have any liberty? A very limited liberty. Some, right? Because you have a choice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. There was an old American comedian who used to make a, um, a thing out of being so cheap. So he had a skit once where the guy came up and said, your money, your life, gun in his head. It was a long silence. The audience sits there for a while. He says, I'm thinking, namely, money, life, it's kind of close. Um, there is a choice. For most of it's an easy choice. Take the money, give me my life. So it is coercive, but there is still some choice. From that, Berlin says, you can now see what would give you more choice would be, first thing, more alternatives. These are pretty limited. I have to either give you something which I like a lot, which is my wallet, or something I like even more, which is my life. What if I have a third option? I don't have to give you either one. That would be great. So the first thing he says down here in his sub-A in the footnote is, how many possibilities are open to me? The degrees of liberty I have depend on how many possibilities. But of course, secondly, how possible are they? 
says in B, how easily actualized are these possibilities? Does it cost me much? Are they cheap possibilities or expensive possibilities? If you go down his list, how important are these possibilities to my life plan? How valuable are these possibilities? He ends up with a matrix of the degree to which you actually have an absence of restraint. The more possibilities you have, the less restraint um, there is. So, can you make sense of this common saying in criminal law? The common saying is that one positive requirement in the criminal law takes away as much liberty, negative liberty, takes away as much liberty as a whole handful of negative requirements. The argument is one positive requirement takes away as much liberty as hundreds of negative prohibitions. But to justify the Anglo-American criminal law distinction between positive and negative duties, we have thousands of negative duties, not so many positive duties, because we're a libertarian society. A negative prohibition takes away a lot less liberty than a positive requirement in the law. Does that make any sense in light of this calculus from Berlin? If the law requires you here and now to do something. He's actually saying that the boundaries of our freedom, of our choices are relative. So it could be the other way, the, the way opposite to the American law, as far as you understand the question. Well, so far it's only conceptual. Well, I only use the American law as an illustration. The conceptual claim is that one positive requirement takes away more liberty than hundreds of negative prohibitions. So suppose I call on you to speak now. I can't see these name charts, so I'm having a hard time. Um, I call on one of you to speak now. If this imposes a duty on you, which it probably doesn't, if it imposes a duty, are you free to do anything else at this moment? Yes, sir. <laughs> it depends if you can multitask, right? But if, if you're responding to the question, it takes away your ability to make some notes, do what some of our students do, which is play video games on their computers, takes away your ability to do a whole bunch of other things. The argument is, that's like many negative prohibitions, a positive requirement. Here and now to do action A is like a negative requirement not to do B, C, D, E, F, G, all the actions you can't do while you're doing action A. That at least is the argument about the degrees of liberty taken away by positive versus negative. Um, that's the kind of an analysis that Berlin wants to make possible conceptually by saying we can quantify freedom, we can quantify degrees of negative freedom by the degree of restraint itself quantified by the degree of opportunities left open to you, alternatives as you put it, and how, how actualizable they are, how costly, how important, and the like. So does he agree with that? No. Yeah. No, no, this is no, just me. My, that, that was simply an illustration of where many people, not Berlin, want to make sense of talking about degrees of freedom. I'm going to leave the conceptual question and talk about the moral question. Once you separate, as does Berlin, negative liberty and the tradition from which he speaks, negative liberty from the positive ability to achieve what you want, positive liberty. What's the value of negative liberty? Start with Berlin again. He discusses John Stuart Mill, whose famous essay on liberty is about as definitive as John Locke in the Western tradition about liberty. And he says Mill has two different sorts of arguments. This is on pages um, four and five in the last column of four, first column of five. <laughs> Mill has two different sorts of arguments. One of them is, First column on page five. One of them is, first paragraph, first full paragraph, all coercion 
is bad as such. And therefore, all non-interference, which is the opposite of coercion, is good as such, although it's not the only good thing. This is the negative conception of liberty in its classic form. Is Berlin attributing to Mill the following view? And is it plausible? Negative liberty is an intrinsic good? Not intrinsic. Everybody thinks there are intrinsic goods. So do you. You can't help it. Most of the goods in this world may be instrumental goods, but something has to be intrinsic goods, otherwise instrumental goods would have no goods to be instrumental to. So everybody has a theory. Now, John Finnis's book, Natural Law, Natural Rights, 1980, says there's seven good things. That takes guts, right? There's only seven good intrinsically good things. I don't know how many intrinsically good things there are. Mill, of course, has was committed to being only one intrinsically good thing. He's a utilitarian, namely human happiness, or his predecessor, Bentham, human pleasure. Everybody has a theory of the intrinsic good. Is Berlin thinking that the absence of state coercion is an intrinsic good? Is it an intrinsically good that the state leave you alone? If it is, you don't have to say what it's good for. You just say it's good. But is that plausible? Berlin, I think Berlin, I don't remember what you're saying about the kind of uh, values the freedom has. It generalizes in Mill's position. He does. And he doesn't, to Mill, it's a, it's he doesn't a, tell you what he thinks, but that's okay because we're more interested in what you think anyway. We don't know what Berlin thinks about negative liberty. Is it an intrinsic good? But why don't we figure it out? Does it seem plausible that this is intrinsically good? Um, that the state leaves you alone? The state not restrain you with coercive law? It is still not an intrinsic good. And positive uh, freedom, is it uh, good, intrinsically good? Well, that would be another question. We can ask that one, too. That's a problem. But, but the, the focus is negative. We can talk about positive for a while if you want, and then see whether negative is instrumental or positive. Let's do that. Positive liberty. Is it good to have more opportunities? Is it intrinsically good that you have more things you're able to do so that you have a wider choice? To some extent, there are some boundaries. So a negative freedom uh, so makes these boundaries to positive freedom, from my point of view. Negative freedom makes boundaries to positive. Well, that I don't understand. I can understand saying it's instrumental to positive freedom, but I don't know how negative freedom gives boundaries to positive freedom. And I think you have the intuition there's such a thing as too much freedom. Yes. Abuse of freedom. I mean, nobody reads Jean-Paul Sartre anymore, the French existentialist, but Sartre had this image in the late 1940s that the ideal human condition would be a for itself, as it's usually translated from the French, where you realize that all things are at all times possible for you. Everything is open. Can you lead your life that way? Suppose it were the case that you had an unbounded set of things you could do at any given time. Would that be a good thing no, or a bad thing? That's a, bit, a bad thing if you will or would read yourself and the world around you if in this freedom goes without boundaries. Some people would find it paralyzing, wouldn't they, to have that kind of opportunities? I mean, maybe we're blessed in having limited capacities to only do a few things. Some of us are only good at one thing, for example. Um, what if you had the opportunity to do everything? You, know, you could win an Olympic gold medal in bobsledding, you could become a prime minister, you could do X, Y, and Z. Would you like us to, to agree with that? Would you like us to say yes? <laughs> Not, well, no, I'd like you to say what you think. Maybe that's your ideal. I do think there's an intuition that it can be paralyzing to have too many opportunities. And of course, tradition-minded societies think that with vengeance. 
They think tradition bounds human choice in a, may, in a way that makes it manageable. But now all of that's about positive liberty. I started with negative liberty. Is the absence of state coercion something that you should say is intrinsically good? It's right up there with justice, with what you want out of the state. Um, namely, the state that governs best is the state that governs least, intrinsically. Is that an intrinsic good for human beings, or is it only instrumentally so? In some ways, I mean, you people are all in the business of coercive law. Anyone who thinks that negative liberty is intrinsically good has to think that what you're concerned with is intrinsically bad, right? Namely, coercive law as such is a bad thing. No, it's not you're in a bad it's profession. Not, it's not correct in uh, according to Berlin. Because, for example, it means integrity, love of proof, fear of individualism, and so on. Uh, as a values that could be a better reach in a totalitarian or a mil military society. So but that's the other thing he attributes not to Mill. He says, look, Mill thinks not only that negative liberty is intrinsically good, but that it's instrumentally good. It's good not for itself. It's good to be free of state interference because, Mill, you become a creative, productive, interesting human being. That's to say it's instrumentally good. It's not intrinsically good to be free of state coercion, but it's instrumentally good, Mill thought, because it's the only way that you become creative, for example, is to be left alone to find whatever your juices will find. Let's try the instrumental. I, I don't see anybody biting hard on the intrinsic good. It's intrinsically good that there not be coercive law. That's kind of hard for lawyers. To accept. That means our profession is concerned with something that's intrinsically bad. Is it intrinsically good, is it instrumentally good, that there be less law? I.e. that people be more free to decide for themselves. Now the first thing up is Mill's notion it makes you creative. Does it make you creative for the state to leave you alone? According to Mill, yes. According, According to Mill, what do you think? Take political art. If you want good art, should the state get out of the direction business about how art should be done? It could be different. It could be different because, well, for example, some major pieces of medieval culture, medieval art, was within the Catholic Church, for example and as a critic of Catholic, uh, Catholic tradition. So it could be both ways. And Mill, Mill um, so it well, he confuses this to the past. It depends from the society. No, it it from, he says you should not intervene in anything. Mm -hmm. Why? No, it's, yeah, it's about creativity. It depends yeah. on the case. The it it depends on the case. Not some cases. Case. 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 An illustration is hardly makes the general point whether or not negative liberty is in general instrumental to creativity. What I tried to do in the article that I called um, briefly Freedom, over here starting on page 7, is say what it is people traditionally have thought, starting on page 9, makes liberty instrumentally valid, negative liberty instrumentally valid. One is something we just discussed. Namely, it looks of value to positive liberty because one of the ways in which you could lack the ability to do something is for the state to coerce you out of it. Coercive laws always take away opportunities. And if opportunities in general are good, then one reason to value negative liberty instrumentally is because you value positive liberty intrinsically. There are the limits we were talking about, about positive liberty. Unbounded positive liberty is not an obvious um, good. But maybe there's a range where some of it is, and negative liberty gets in its way. Take number two and three on the list on page nine, which I think are more interesting. I call the Millian and Kantian autonomy. And those aren't just my labels. I think that's pretty much the Western standard labeling. Mill and Kant had very different notions of autonomy. Neither one of them 
equate autonomy with liberty. Two different things, which is why if you say negative liberty is good for autonomy, you're making an instrumental argument, not an argument about intrinsic goodness. Autonomy is different than liberty. Mill's notion of autonomy, different than Kant's, so we end up with two different instrumental arguments. Let's see what you think of both of them. Mill's notion of autonomy is this one. An autonomous choice is one that is simply free of the constraints of others. It's your choice, you are the agent. At one point on Liberty Mill compares human beings who are indoctrinated by their parents or their church or their government into a rigid set of beliefs. He says those people are not worth more than his comparison, a steam engine. They are just machines. They have simply taken in what they've been given without any kind of modification. And he said, they're not worth anything. People become worth something. Their choices are worthy of state protection. Only when they have a hand in the development of those choices, and the only way they can have a hand, this is his instrumental argument about creativity, the only way they can have a hand is if the state leaves them alone. The state, as well as the church and their parents, have to give them enough freedom for them to develop autonomous choices, choices that make them an agent worthy of respect. Millian autonomy is simply the conditions of free choice that make human choice worthwhile at all. It's so interesting that Kant had a very different notion of autonomy. He wasn't concerned at all about the way in which people might be indoctrinated and in that sense not free of autonomous. He was concerned with people acting for right reasons. His ethical duties as opposed to juridical duties were aimed at the reasons for which people acted more than the actions themselves. So that your categorical imperative was to do action A for reason R not just to do action A. The reasons for which people did their actions, as he says at one point, the beginning of the groundwork, is the locus of value for human beings. So take his example about charitable giving. Kantian autonomy needs negative liberty because if the state coerces you to give, then although you've given money to the poor, you've done the action, action A, you haven't probably done for the right reason. Charitable giving, Kant, charitable giving is valuable because of the motive of benevolence with which it's done, not simply because you gave money from you who has more to someone who has less. And if what you're trying to do with law is maximize value, the value lies in the reason, which means, Kant, the law has to step away. The law has to not restrain you. The law has to let you figure out that you should give money to the poor. Then the giving will be motivated by benevolent motives and will be worth something morally, as opposed to giving coerced by the state, which he says that's just like a tax. Now notice those two very different notions of autonomy, both of which need negative liberty. One is for you to be the source of your own choice as a self-formed human agent. And the other is to act for right reasons. Both of them are thought to be needing um, negative liberty in order for you to be an autonomous human agent, i.e. an agent of moral worth on these very different um, notions. Uh, what do you think of those two? One of them better than the other? Either of them any good? Just depends upon position. <laughs> on your point of view. It all, all things do. All things do. But we all need points of view, right? I mean, I think the Kantian connection is plausible. The question is whether you agree with the baseline that... Actually, I disagree with both of them. What's that? Actually, I disagree with both You disagree with both of them? Well, no. Um, because, well, if, if, you're, if, if you're an agnostic, you're, you just can't, cannot say that a creature is itself in principle. And... Uh, uh, that's, no. As to Kant, 
It's how, how, how can you prove that a certain kind of behavior is good, a certain kind of choice is intrinsically good? Well, but look, the proof problem is true for all of us. I mean, look, ethics is hard but to prove. It's an existential uh, problem. It's a uh, problem of uh, living in society, also. But, I mean, the way in which you can establish one of these moral positions is that you find certain aspects intuitive and you argue from that. None of us has any knockdown ability to deliver to any of the rest of us so indisputable proofs of moral positions. The question is really one of plausibility. Whether this is something that seems plausible as a basis for arguing for liberty. Let me just run through the rest because I know we should take a break pretty soon uh, as well. I go through three more at the bottom of the second column on nine and over on to ten. Three more arguments, and let me just give them to you um, seriatim, one at a time. One of them is Mill's own, or at least it's an interpretation of Mill that Jack Wells and Harvard used to give. The problem for Mill is Mill's supposed to be utilitarian. How does he get a robust right to liberty out of his utilitarianism? Here was Rawls' answer on behalf of Mill. Mill thinks that the only good thing you should maximize in political theory is the satisfaction of people's preferences. Whatever they prefer, that being satisfied is what a good society should maximize. That's what makes him what's called a preference utilitarian. But Mill had a condition about preferences. It isn't any human preference that counts. To have a preference that makes utilitarianism plausible, you have to have negative liberty to allow people to develop their own preferences. Otherwise, you end up with state policy forming the preferences which justify state policy. You want independently worthwhile preferences, preferences people develop independent of state policy, that then can be used, if you're a utilitarian, to justify state policy. So Rawls presented it as a million argument about a presupposition of utilitarianism. You need liberty, negative liberty, in order to make utilitarianism a plausible social philosophy. One kind of argument for negative liberty if you find utilitarianism plausible. The fifth argument, as I label it over here on, on page 10, um, is an argument simply about the contingent pattern of human preference. There's a book by Herzog, a political philosopher, Don Herzog, uh, that I put down in the footnotes, University of Michigan, who has a book called Happy Slaves, The Myth of the Happy Slave. My suspicion is there weren't a lot of happy slaves, that most people prefer to be their own masters, most people prefer to make their own decisions. In which event, if you are a preference utilitarian, negative liberty is instrumentally good to the satisfaction of an almost universal human preference, which is to make your own decisions. In which event, it's a good thing, instrumentally, for utilitarian. The sixth and last on page 10 um, is also utilitarian. It has to do with the costs of state coercion. The cost is a bad thing because it takes away from other opportunities. The kinds of costs of state coercion, some of them are obvious, like you have to have police and courts, but some of them aren't so obvious. So if, for example, you criminalize, as did California for decades, consenting homosexual behavior, since that's typically done in private, you need means of detection. So at Yosemite Park in California, the park rangers decided the way to find out whether homosexual activity was going on in the public bathrooms was they put one-way glass on the bathrooms and they had a park ranger sitting up above watching what was going on in each of the stalls. Now, not only did it cost money to pay the park ranger, but the cost to the privacy of everybody is a cost to be reckoned with having a law against homosexual behavior. If you're really going to enforce it, it doesn't just cost money, it also costs something of value, namely the privacy of people as they use the public restrooms is a cost given up in this mode of enforcement. It's also the case if you have certain sorts of crimes like prostitution, drug use, and the like, if those are criminal, 
Given the fact of human motivation, every society will have that behavior despite its criminalization. It gives rise to the phenomenon of crime tariff, and a cost of that prohibition is that you fund organized crime, mafia. You fund them by virtue of criminalizing behavior and therefore artificially restricting the supply for something about which you cannot control the demand. And the result is that you get monopolistic prices that brings in basically criminal elements who are willing to be criminal. And you've ended up making your society worse by criminalizing these kinds of behaviors. So there's costs of criminalization, which are reasons not to criminalize, i.e. reasons in favor of negative liberty. Let me just ask you then one last question before we take, I gather, a short break. Um, it's a question that comes out of Isaiah Berlin. If you have some such set of values making negative liberty either intrinsically valuable or, more plausibly, I think, instrumentally valuable, how valuable is it piece of other things? He says, Berlin, if you don't have any boots, you probably don't care much about Shakespeare, which I know that you people care a lot about because you've been talking about Shakespeare. Um, Anatoly France's critique of French liberalism. You know, if you don't have any money, you don't care much about liberty, you really rather have something to eat. Does that show that liberty is not of value, or that it's not as valuable as other things? The leading liberal theorist in America, John Rawls, put it this way, all it shows is there's a presupposition for liberty being valuable. Rawls started his major first book, A Theory of Justice, this way. This is a book, he said, of a just society with certain material conditions being satisfied. If you don't have those, then you'll give up lots of things. I started teaching this seminar, this kind of seminar, 20 years ago for the German government in an old Habsburg palace south of Budapest. We called it Raising Rights Consciousness. I remember my students, some of them who moved from the Ukraine, um, gave up not just liberty. They said, look, equality. Equality is really good, but as opposed to an exactly equal division of a very small pie, they said, we'd really rather have an unequal division of a much larger pie. And incidentally, they said the division wasn't all that equal under the old communist regime anyway. Um, any value could easily be given up if, in fact, some basic needs aren't met. That doesn't show it's not valuable. The entire Western tradition of equality, democracy, liberty, particular liberties, they may indeed have a presupposition of material well-being, Rawls's point. The entire Western liberal tradition is hostage to certain material conditions being met, otherwise it would indeed be rational to trade, say, political liberty for something to eat if you don't have anything to eat. That doesn't show it's not worth a lot. Once the conditions are met, Rawls said, liberty has a priority over material well-being. Indeed, in Rawls's view, liberty is prior along with equality. The two values distinctive of a liberal state um, are something you shouldn't trade off against utility. But that's only if you've reached a certain level of material well-being. So there's the, the trade-off point, which only proves perhaps there's a bounded set of conditions to liberty like every other value in Western liberal traditions. It doesn't show that it's not extremely valuable. Did we want to break for a while? 10, 15 minutes? Okay.